Welcome to Skillet Live, our digital platform. We launched it last month uh, with a creative writing workshop in collaboration with Kodakanal International School. It, this workshop was for 25 of our students and the students of the Kodakanal International School. And the workshop was led by writers Shiny Anthony and Sampurna Chatterjee. In spite of the lockdown and enforced isolation, Skillet remains a warm, welcoming space that continues to build and, uh, and also nurture a community of readers. This Meet the Author program is yet another attempt to widen the readership of high quality literature. We are delighted to bring to you Anuradha Roy, all the way from the cold, uh, rocky, uh, I mean, Himalayan uh, foothills, all the way down south, almost close to the equator. Anuradha is quite capable of building lush green gardens. Uh, she can make that possible in the Himalayan terrain. She can work wonders in Madurai. Welcome, Anuradha, to an experience of the warmth of Skillet, the warmth of the American College, and the warmth of the Temple City of Madurai. That's the best welcome I ever had. Thank you. Oh, we are so <laughs> pleased that you could join us. Anuradha, your novels have been a sensation in the literary world. Each time you publish a novel, we can be certain that it will get into the long list of nominations for national and international awards. And then they work their way up to the shortlist and even, I mean, even become a winner. You are a success story, but you remain a gentle hermit. You seem to consciously avoid self-promotion and particularly the social media. Yet your novels figure in the uh, reading list of academic courses in premier institutions Recently, I watched a lovely uh, movie by the school students of Philippines because it's a school text there. And this was a mandatory project that they did for uh, environmental awareness. No, if you knew you had so much in you, the enormous ability to impact the young and the old alike, why did you have to wait this long to start writing fiction? Why did you have to wait till you turned 40? Can you tell us something about your writing career, the genesis of it all, the agony of finding the very first publisher? Actually, I started writing very, very early in life because um, I'm the younger of two siblings and my brother started going to school uh, obviously before me and I thought that he was uh, going somewhere wonderful so to 
make things easier for me to make give me something to do my mother had given me a blank red notebook thinking i wouldn't do very much but scribble pictures and so on but right from the beginning i started writing little nonsensical stories in it and recently i went back to delhi to clear some cupboards and found stacks of old notebooks from my school days and all of them were filled with terrible imitations of winnie the pooh and things like that so i was writing all along and a newspaper the indian express published some of those stories when i was in my teens but i never thought of becoming like people say i always wanted to become a writer i had never wanted to become a writer i had always uh, really wanted to be making books behind the scenes i wanted to be a publisher and that's what i was i worked uh, after finishing my studies i worked at the oxford university press and it was after leave i was completely happy working there and it was after leaving oxford which was a time of a lot of turmoil that there was some space which opened up when i felt that i wanted to write something that was not a book review or a news article which i had done in the past but my own book and i started that i actually finished it maybe when i was about 37 but for a year or so it just kept getting rejected by publishers and agents abroad and in india i had only submitted it to uh, no i hadn't submitted it at that stage anyway the whole process of acceptance took more than a year or so and uh, it's because of that that the book got published only when i turned 40 and the the way i met my publisher was very coincidental because uh, i had gone to london for a intern uh, there was some young publishers thing that british council used to run i'm forgetting the exact name of it but it was a kind of conference and i had gone there and one of the speakers at the on the final day was a very renowned british publisher called christopher macleod who was uh, giving uh, a talk on before him where many people had talked and publishing had in that time turned extremely sort of market oriented books were called products and you were treated like a brand manager and so on and christopher was the only person at that conference who actually spoke of books as and authors as books as i recognize them to be things you read things you uh, to do with the intelligence and taste and involvement and passion so at the end of his talk i went and asked him if he would read a few pages from my novel which was rejected by everybody else and he uh, insists now that i handed him 100 odd pages but i know it was only 30 so i gave him those 30 and that was how the book got accepted and published by him no the international dublin literary award nomination makes us all very very proud you know Thank all you. the lives we never mm. lived is the very first novel by an indian citizen to figure in the short list this happens to be also the 25th edition the silver jubilee award yes. and we hope you get it and killet is a specialized library this nomination means much more to us partly because you know the short list is drawn from uh, 156 titles from around the world and all these have been nominated by libraries premier public libraries in different countries and continents and it is these libraries that have brought the 2018 novel already a recipient of several awards back into the spotlight that makes us really proud and this book touches hearts it will remain the favorite for generations of students and readers congratulations anuradha and we are particularly thankful to christopher mcclus 
for recognizing Anuradha's great potential as an artist and for urging you to write on and on and to use your words for being the patron saint of lost causes. <laughs> um, yes. uh, my question to you is, you know, Permanent Black is one of the uh, most distinguished academic publishing companies. Even when your unit was very young, as you just said, British Council had named it as one of the 12 outstanding young publishing houses. Am I right? And yes. Did, yeah. did you have the expertise background when you launched this Permanent Black or was it a leap in faith? No, it wasn't a leap because uh, my husband, Rukun Advani, had been in publishing for 18 years. He had been running the OUP's academic publishing program for a lot of that time. And before that, he was a senior editor at the OUP. And I had joined OUP as a, as a junior editor and become an acquisitions editor for literature by the time I left. So between the two of us, we had experience in all the departments of publishing by the time we started Permanent Black. Apart from which Rukun's father was, uh, he had a bookshop in Lucknow. So Rukun particularly is very uh, knowledgeable about all aspects of the book trade, which I am not. I'm much more comfortable with book design and um, ed editorial uh, work, but not, I've, I was never able to, for example, when you're publishing a book, you have to, you had to know at least earlier how much paper you would need. You had to be able to do costings to see how much a particular book would cost for you to publish. And I'm terrible at mathematics and I always made a mess of these costings, which were the bane of my life at the OUP. But between the, fortunately we have very complementary skills. So now I design the book covers and books and he does everything else. That's how it works. And uh, I would like to add that Skillet has at least 86 of your titles, Permanent Black. Oh, that's wonderful title. to me. Yeah. And, and also a few of your authors, for instance, Lisa Mitchell and Sarah Dickey. Yeah, they, yeah. they had used Skillet as a space for them to write and discuss their uh, drafts. And they have used the library extensively. And some of our, uh, your distinguished authors, like Gopal Krishna Gandhi, Anuradha Needham, uh, Sumati Ramasamy, Rajeshwari Sundar Rajan, all of them have made presentations also in Skillet. That's and, wonderful. Uh, yeah. yeah. And I'm just eager to know, uh, why you have named it permanent black. Uh, for me, well, whiteness may be an absence of color, but black in a sense is also absence of color. Why have you uh, named it like that? Do you see white as a binary of black? Actually, OUP, uh, when we left the OUP, it was a firm that was run uh, from Britain and partly New York, but mostly Britain. And partly, I suppose, the name was a kind of rebellion against the whiteness of the OUP, which we, uh, well, I won't go into the details. It's very boring of what had happened at that time. But uh, partly it was against that whole hegemony, for want of a better word, of the white world in in the kind of publishing we had been doing. And also it's more for me a reference to the ink because both Rukun and I, we both liked using fountain pens to write with and we both used black ink and permanent black is the name of that ink after which the press is named. Oh, I was just curious about the adjective, use of the adjective permanent. Mm -hmm. And what does that logo uh, stand for, Black Kettle? It just shows things are bubbling and steaming. Uh, okay. And actually, when we were starting it, everybody told us we would be in the red for years to come. 
and we wanted to also prove it wrong and it didn't happen it got off okay. Um, Anuradha, you have enjoyed the love and friendship of two vibrant Sheilas in your life. Mm -hmm. Your mother, Sheila Roy, has been a companion in uh, climbing hills. In mm -hmm. fact, she has initiated you into hill climbing. And she, uh, Sheila Roy and her sister together had been your guides, sort of in the research tours that you had taken up when you wrote um, uh, novels. And they enabled refreshingly new uh, insights and perspectives that you say otherwise may not be have been possible. Uh, and I also think your father is such mm -hmm. an important inspirational figure in your novels. Uh, your uh, you have modeled even a character after him, yeah. and the dedication for Baba here to me it seems like. His absence is such a presence. Mm -hmm. Is there any female character in your novels uh, that has been inspired by Sheila Roy, Sheila Roy, whom you adore and admire? No, not directly, no. I wouldn't uh, say so. But in the, I certainly know that uh, because my mother paints she's an artist she uh, she paints and the you, when you're building characters actually it doesn't happen directly in that way that you base a, no, a particular character entirely on somebody who has come from your life but you uh, characters might begin with a kind of a few molecules from somebody or the other or a vague impression or or just a glimpse of someone and then gradually become get developed into somebody who might carry a bit of the original breath from the original person but become somebody else entirely when you're writing about them and they grow and develop according to the demands of the novel so I wouldn't say I've directly drawn on my mother for any of the characters. No, no, no. Although the, I mean, you could say that Gayatri in the final novel is an artist and my own mother is an artist, but I, I don't see Gayatri as drawing on her at all. Not really. Yeah. Of course, I came to know paint boxes because of my mother. So that was uh, maybe figuring in it somewhere. Mm -hmm. Okay, you know, in your novels, historical figures and imaginary characters jostle with one another in your fiction. Gayatri, for instance, mm -hmm. she interacts with Tagore and also has a close bond with uh, Walter Spies. Where and how do you draw a line between the demands of authenticity and the demands of fictional integrity? Uh, my question specifically is, does your research, extensive research, come in the way of your uh, imagination? Does it in any way choke your imagination? That's quite a danger, actually, if you're writing anything historical. And I find that when I'm reading historical novels, I, I really don't feel interested in being in getting information in those books. I don't like the books that, uh, historical books that wear the knowledge so plainly on it that you're bumping into it at every stage and are not able to enter the book emotionally or intellectually. And when I, when I was writing um, this book, I was very conscious of the fact that I didn't want I had to do all the research and reading but I didn't want it to like you say that's quite a wonderful way of putting it that you choke the the narrative in any way and I had been actually I'd been reading this um, American writer Janet Malcolm who writes extremely well on a variety of topics from psychoanalysis to Chekhov and she had written a book in which she examined a, a murder case in America 
And this brought her up against this very question of how to represent people from real life in a narrative you're making. And she described a journal, you know, she described the realm of writing as a, as a space, like a house in which a journalist or a historian is a tenant, but a fiction writer is the owner. So a tenant has to go into a house and can occupy it but has to leave it much the same, exactly the same, in fact. You cannot alter that house in any way. Whereas a fiction writer can go into that house and break down the parts of it that, uh, you know, they want to in order to make of it what they have in their mind as part of their fictional narrative. So I had to, I had to feel free to do that. I had to digest the history, but bring it out as fiction. Okay. And I was just thinking, why do so much re research if you are going to discard some information and if you're <laughs> going to deviate from that, you might as well focus on just your imagination. I thought, now I see what you mean. And all the lives, you know, that novel is something that refuses to leave the reader long after it is read. The opening line says it all, yet the novel manages very well to sustain the sense of loss. On the one hand, the readers are, I guess, are very happy that Gayatri managed to find a way out of oppression and a route to artistic freedom, fulfillment, but the pain of abandonment, aban I just the lost the last. I was just saying that the pain of abandonment is so real also, mainly because the, I think, you know, the child doesn't ask to be born. I'm not being judgmental at all. The societal identity gets established for this little boy mm -hmm. uh, as the son of the mother uh, who has run away with a white man. It is not the running away from an adult, fellow adult that kind of bothers me but the running away, leaving the child behind, that kind of hurts. Uh, it is a kind of broken promise as well. The promise of Bali as a dream destination. You know, she keeps narrating so many things about Bali. She keeps promising. And obviously Gayatri is such a special, very good mother. The obsessive remembrance of, his, of her parenting style uh, her remembrance of her voice as a singer, as a storyteller. You know, I think she's a very hard to get mother mm -hmm. and it's also hard to lose mother. Uh, whereas the father belongs to the good ridden category. <laughs> so abandonment is not a tragedy. To use Rukun Atwani's words about country, you know, uh, abandonment itself is mostly a matter of uh, the mind. Okay. Mm -hmm. And have you used the package of letters as a way to reveal more on hindsight? Uh, you know, to me, it seems like it's giving the son, now the adult son, a tactile experience of the loss. Letters that come laden with feathers and leaves. Mm -hmm. The mother is in a sense inaccessible. She can't be touched, mm -hmm. but the son is kind of privileged to touch the objects that are handpicked by the mother. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And also, you know, you have uh, so beautifully captured the essence of the patriarchal notions that we live with. You know, the father believes in the freedom for the country, but he doesn't believe in the freedom for his own wife. The society may even um, seem to understand a woman running away with the lover. You know, the call of romance can be better understood than the call for artistic freedom. A mm -hmm. woman, it's sad that a woman can either be an artist or a mother and never be both. And it's also interesting that um, no blame falls on the father for shedding his responsibilities and um, or abandoning the son 
the accusing fingers, even the nine-year-old fingers, you know, accusing fingers are all, all of them point to Gayatri mm -hmm. as the only cause of uh, tragedy. Um, uh, do you agree with me? Actually, the, uh, it's not only Gayatri. If you, uh, in the book, there is also the character of Begum Akhtar, who yeah. is a singer. Uh, and of course, she's a real singer from his, drawn from history. And there is also the figure of Beryl de Zoot, who was the British dancer. And both of these women, uh, when Begum Akhtar married, because Begum Akhtar began life as a professional singer in real life. And when she, after she married, her husband uh, forbade her going on stage uh, for the rest of her life. And she obeyed that for some time. And then she fell into a very deep depression and was told, uh, her husband was told that if this woman did not sing, then she would just lose her mind. And I wanted to look at this kind of woman for whom, uh, there is a passion other than uh, husband, home, and child, which is the overriding passion. And the introduction of uh, these two women was meant to sort of reflect uh, where Gayatri is coming from as well, that her need to uh, be an artist and to find the independence and the uh, space to do what she needs to do is as great as any, you know, it's a stereotype that women will always leave in order to go away with another man, or they will only leave for love and romance. But Gayatri actually leaves because she just wants to work. Bali just happens to be the place where she ends up because Walter Spies li lives there, but she would have left for anywhere. Mm. She actually you know, did intend taking her child. She was extremely attached to him, but anyway. <laughs> but the fact is that she didn't, you know, that is something that yeah, bothers but, me. Yeah, I, uh, yes, it does. But in, in truth, the kind of thing that happens to Walter Spies's life as well as hers is really a reflection of how all kinds of enormous forces of history as we are realizing today with the pandemic and all that can completely overturn uh, whatever mm -hmm. plans you might have we were meant to do this session in person in madurai after all and we are <laughs> doing it on a computer screen <laughs> thank you when anuradha does not work with words or visuals she works with mud her able fingers mold raw materials into lovely forms. We'll show you a video clipping of Anuradha in action for those who are not familiar with the idea that she is wonderful. She makes wonderful artifacts.
that is the creator's smile. Anuradha, <laughs> I understand that you never sell your uh, lovely creations, uh, but do you ever give them? I was just checking. That's all. Uh, no, no, you know, earlier, if I made something very good, I couldn't bear to part with it. And you can't sell something that's bad. There are plenty of things that don't turn out right. But I just recently sold my first two pieces and felt very victorious about it. Now I've managed to part with them, uh, at least to friends who want to buy. Yeah. But I've never had exhibitions. I've always only given my pots to people I think will actually want them and or I use them myself. Mm -hmm. And you take coffee or tea in them yourself? All our households, uh, mugs, bowls, plates, uh, teapots are made by me. We have a wow. table usually of almost entirely things I've made. Hmm. Uh, there are so many questions, you know, our students are waiting to ask you num so many uh, questions. So I don't want to mon uh, monopolize. This multifaceted, amazing artist, Anuradha Roy, is all yours, friends, for the next uh, many minutes, till maybe 3.35, to be precise. OK, yeah, yeah. What? How they, will the questions come to me? Uh, they will uh, unmute and okay. uh, I mean, ask okay. questions. Okay. The administrator will regulate it. Okay. Joel Timothy. Okay. So we have received a lot of questions from this uh, audience. Okay. We will call uh, you individually to ask your questions. When your name is called, please uh, unmute your audio, switch on the video and ask your question. Please keep your questions short and clear. Now, the first question will be asked by Dr. Kanag Geeta Kanagaraj. Hello. Yes, hello. How does it feel to live with the, another established novelist, Rukun Advani, of uh, uh, Beethoven Among the Cows fame? Um, you seem to share a beautiful personal and professional life with your husband, Rukun. You're a passionate uh, hill climber mm -hmm. and a dedicated non-climber. <laughs> you call him a beloved tyrant. The complete dedication is to three beloved tyrants in that uh, dedication. One was my dog, Biscuit. One was Rukun and one is my publisher, Christopher McLehose. And I think the beloved tyrant is a tongue in cheek way of putting the role that all of them play in my life, which is of a kind of, uh, well, it's a kind of loving bullying, I would say, in the sense that after I've written something, I give it to Rukun to read. He's the first person to read what I've written. And then uh, there's a lot of, uh, you can almost feel the tension in the house because when he appears to be not reading it, I feel resentful. And when he's reading it, I'm feeling tense. And he keeps making faces while he's reading, uh, which can be expressed. When he's very quiet and just reading, I know it's going well. But when he starts making faces, I know that he's just hating what he's reading. So there's quite a lot of turmoil when a first draft is written, but it ends up being quite enjoyable. I, I like the whole process. So he, he reads them and he reacts and suggests things. And then I go off and have a tantrum, temper tantrum and then start to see that some of his suggestions are same. And I sit and try to redraft if I want to using some of those suggestions. So it's very good to have a novelist in the house too. Next that answer question, your question is from. Uh, 
Next question is from Professor David. Um, Anuradha, this is uh, David, and uh, this is a question about uh, the many languages. Mm -hmm. uh, you speak uh, Bengali to your mother, yeah. uh, Hindi to your dogs, and mm -hmm. English and Hindi to your husband, Yes. and uh, English to all of us here now, right now. Yes. Have you ever attempted to write in Bengali or any other language or uh, tried your hand at translating works, uh, Bengali works into English? I've translated from Bengali for this, uh, the fourth book. The fourth book actually has quite a lot of passages translated from a novel written by an aunt of mine who was a renowned writer in Bengali called Moitre Dedi. And uh, there's a book she's written called Na Honnote, which means it shall not die. And I translated parts of it, which I wanted to include in uh, the fourth novel, because the character in Na Honnote has a lot of parallels with my main character's Gayatri. She falls in love, in her case, she does fall in love with a Romanian philosopher, Mircea Eliade, and the book is based on that romance and sections of it uh, I translated because I, although there was an English translation, I didn't like the way it was done. Otherwise, I've never attempted writing in Bengali. I used to when I was a child, but I didn't after that because I had to switch to learning Hindi and I lost all my Bengali at that point. Thank you, thank you. So, now we have Janani with a question. Good afternoon, ma'am. I have afternoon. two questions. Mm -hmm. I found the passages on dogs in all the lives we never lived very comforting and even read out a few sections to my dog uh, when she was awaiting surgery in the hospital. Yeah. And uh, as, we, as I read your blog, I understood that even your writerly space and your books, they are both dog eared So can you please tell us how Mishka, Piku, Biskut and all the dogs you raised shaped your life, writing and essential responses? And what have your dogs added to your writing or what would it lack if it weren't for your dogs? And the second question is, uh, in the letters written by Gayatri, Mishkin's mother, some words are underlined. What does that suggest? Does it have any special meaning now? The underlining was really uh, where she is emphasizing the word. Like, uh, you're probably too young to have ever written letters, but when we wrote letters by hand, then there was a lot of underlining and uh, you know arrows going up and down the page and so on because a letter is a physical thing and uh, you you can almost talk in a letter in the way that you can't in an email because your handwriting tells people a lot including the underlining and about the dogs uh, well mishka is my publisher's dog christopher's dog and Biscuit was my uh, second dog. My first dog died, uh, you know, was there throughout my childhood. And I was amused when you said that you read to your dog, because when my first dog came, I was only seven years old and she was a puppy. And I was convinced I could teach her to write. So this poor puppy was held down by me for many days and I would put a pencil in her paw or her mouth and try to move it, convinced that by this means I could teach her to write. Ultimately, I gave up. But I think the presence of dogs around me now, three of them, creates a kind of anarchy and unpredictability that is quite wonderful for me in the whole day of uh, trying to sit by myself and write or make pots or do these things which require a lot of focus. I need these bursts of absolute unfocusedness and uh, fun. They are, they are so hilarious to be with as well. Thank you, uh, Anu. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a student named Previn to ask you two questions. Uh, 
So I have a question on uh, sleeping on Jupiter. Uh, that's that's a lot of happening on the cover of the book, and I think they have symbolic function. Uh, I can't hear you that. properly. I can't. I can't. Uh, the the cover of Jupiter. Yes, ma'am. I think they have a symbolic function. Could you mm -hmm. please elaborate on it? And uh, that's another question, ma'am. Uh, so, how do you put yourself on character's shoes, especially when you uh, write for a character like Madal from uh, Sleeping on Jupiter? Uh, how to uh, how to create the how to inhabit the character? You mean? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Well, uh, you know, and this is a specially interesting question when you're writing a negative character, like a, a villain of some kind. And I remember reading a writer quite some time ago who said that, when, particularly when you're writing an evil character, you have to give that person a reason, a really good reason to be the way he is. And while writing any character, if I can understand what is it he or she wants, what is it that makes this person alive in the world, then I find it uh, possible to empathize and inhabit that character and to feel that this is how this character would be in this particular situation. And then layer by layer, the character grows. And Badal in uh, Sleeping on Jupiter is in love with a boy. He's a homosexual temple priest. So this was quite a leap for me to make. But I really uh, thought of him emotionally as a human being uh, who would react much like any other, which goes for even villains. Suraj is a violent and uh, difficult character in that. But it is, it's possible to understand each of those people within their frameworks if you know what, what they really want in that book, in that story. And about the cover of Sleeping on Jupiter, I think that I didn't design it, but I think the designer came up with that image after reading the book as just a kind of churning and turmoil, which is what the book conveyed to him. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Uh Okay, we move on to the next question by Mr. Ganesh Babu. Okay. You play different roles so creatively. Yes. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you now. You're a novelist, media critic, publisher, painter, and a potter. Mm -hmm. How do you manage to schedule your work and time so <laughs> effectively? Yeah. Actually, that's a continuous puzzle. I wish I did schedule it very well, but I don't. I mean, when I'm, I, I just try to divide it. If I'm working on something uh, like redrafting a novel, I don't do anything else or writing the first draft, then I just stop everything else. So I suppose uh, I work by dividing myself up into chunks rather than becoming a 10 armed person doing all those things at the same time. So I, I, I do things one by one. There are times when I'm not making any pots because I'm writing. And then when I finish one phase of writing, I can move on to making something or painting something. So it seems as if I'm doing many things at the same time, but I'm not actually. Thank you. Prince Albert, if you are there, you can ask your question. Yes, Prince, go ahead. Um, yes, uh, I recently read uh, All the Lives We Never Lived. It was a good book, a good read. And, uh, but while ending the book, I was mm -hmm. thinking about uh, whether you had any other alternative endings planned up and did you sort of, you know, decide to not put something in the final draft? Because I thought there are a lot of possibilities in that end and I was just wondering why you decided to choose this ending and why you might have skipped out other possibilities. You know, if you, you're still thinking about the ending and the reason you're thinking about the ending is that it leaves certain things open for you to think about because I would think that the reader has a mind and will continue to think about a book after finishing it, I hope. 
uh, and I think that when you're say when you're writing a thriller, then you would uh, it's very unsatisfying if if you're reading writing or watching a crime thriller, and it leaves things unexplained, or it gets the ending in uh, wrong in such a way that you're wondering at the end who who killed that person anyway. I don't really know this. Because the whole objective of a crime thriller is to tell you who has done it. But a whole objective of a novel of the kind I've written is to open up the world and to make you ask more questions like, could this have happened or could that have happened instead? So it's, it's a different way of approaching the ending. Albert, Albert, okay. Uh, next question is from Akash. Hi, ma'am. Am I audible? Yes, you are. Uh, I read your novel, All the Lives We Never Lived, and I really enjoyed it. Okay. And I have a question. Uh, the idea of freedom is deceptive for Nixon than Guy III. Uh, mm -hmm. Which do you think is more appropriate in the contemporary context? The patriotic freedom proposed by Chand or the individual freedom claimed by Guy III? Not just the contemporary context, but if you take the, when India was under the rule of British, uh, mm -hmm. uh, do you think this pre patriotic freedom was more uh, suitable and comfortable to read? But Gayatri was trying to be kind of selfish. I won't use the word selfish. I'm not looking for the right word. But uh, don't you think the, what was claimed by Chand was more uh, reasonable? Well, uh, if, if you read the book, to, uh, that's a really intelligent question, actually. Because you know that f from the book, you know that there is Tagore in the book as well as one of the characters and uh, Rabindranath Tagore. And one of the things he really stressed was the need for individual creativity and individual development within, uh, you know, this search for freedom uh, that the in individual creativity and development are really paramount in the search for freedom. And he warned that this uh, search for a kind of herd freedom, which is what nationalism can become, could be quite a dangerous thing, which turned against itself. Uh, you, you, in British times, it was against the British, maybe. But you can see the way uh, nationalism can become nothing but a blind following by a herd of a leader in other times. So I would, in any any context, prefer Gayatri's notion of freedom, because that's where freedom begins with the individual. Thank you, Akash, and thank you, Anu. Uh, we'll move on to the next uh, person. We have a question from Meera Kasiraman. I invite the person to unmute and uh, switch on the video to and ask the question. Meera Kasiraman, are you there? Yeah, hello. Yes, please. Uh, hi, ma'am. Uh, first of all, I must say that uh, your Sleeping on Jupiter is one of the uh, three narratives that I am working on for my PhD thesis. And it's such a joy to hold all four of your books okay. and also meet the <laughs> creator of these books. It's uh, it's doubly exciting for me. So thank you, Silit, and thank you, ma'am, for doing this. Uh, my name is Meera Kashi Raman. I'm in my fourth year now. I'm working on, uh, I'm planning to study power relations in uh, Sleeping on Jupiter. Uh, my question is, I have two questions, ma'am. Uh, one, we have this motive of disappearance that recur in your narratives. Mm -hmm. And I also enjoy listening to most of your videos on YouTube. I heard you beautifully quote Galib's Raat B, Neend B, Kahani B, where we mm -hmm. want it all in the context yeah. of Gayatri. So when you want it all, there is a conflict. And I think Nomi doesn't have anything at all. And she's lost almost everything. And she's also in conflict. And quite curiously, both of them resort to disappearance. So would you see this as a passive escapism or would you call it a certain assertion of agency uh, by characters when pitted against a larger force? That's the first question. Okay. Uh, and the second one, Badal talks about fighting pain with pain when he is unable to digest the fact that he cannot have Ra uh, Raghu. He, you, have, you very poignantly talk about fighting pain with pain. On some level, do you think pain could be the reason why there is so much of violence in the world? 
Thank you. These are two gigantic questions. And uh, <laughs> the, the thing about escapism, I, I wouldn't call it escapism. In, in the Sleeping on Jupiter, which you're studying, the, the character of Badal is actually, and all many of the characters are looking for an alternate reality, which allows them to be who they think they are. And this is the case with Gayatri too. She isn't trying to escape. She's trying to find the right place for her. And the second question was about, uh, just remind me, uh, it was about- Fighting pain, pain with pain. Yeah. Uh, Fighting this, pain with pain. This, I, I, I wouldn't know how to answer this in, in, you know, in the sense that if you were to try to analyze the world based on that, I wouldn't know how to do it. To say this is the reason why these horrible things are happening in the world because those people causing all the grief and violence and suffering are in pain. No, I would not say that of many of the people who are causing the grief and suffering at this point. I, I, Donald Trump does not seem to be a man greatly in pain to me, for example and many other leaders that we, I won't name at the moment. But uh, in, in the context of Badal, the way he, uh, the context in which he uses it is much more uh, intimate, uh, intimate pain of rejection by the man he loves. And uh, that's a completely different thing from an abstract public pain, I think. Of, causing pain to large numbers of people in support of some deluded cause or the other. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next, we have Simon Vergis. Mr. Simon Vergis, yes, you can uh, ask the question. Yes, good yeah. afternoon. Yeah, good afternoon, Aladha. Thank you for that insightful thoughts. Uh, I was just wondering, uh, how much does nature play a role in a writer's life? You mean uh, just generally or in my uh, Generally, book? because generally we associate writers with nature and here you are sitting with the backdrop of nature. So just start yeah. game. No, I'm very lucky because we have our house is really at the edge of a forest. It's uh, surrounded by forest. Okay. And for me, the moment I'm uh, slightly stuck in whatever I'm doing or writing, my solution is to go for a very, very long walk. Mm -hmm. And it's not as though I'm setting an agenda for the walk or anything like that, but just to walk in, in, in the forest is something that starts off all kinds of uh, chains of thought that I often come back with whatever roadblock I had miraculously dissolved and gone. So it certainly does. And this whole sense of for example when I guard when I garden there is nothing at all that you can rush there is plenty that is outside your control so the whole uh, time clock which operates in the world of plants and soil is so beyond your control uh, that this kind of patience and the giving up of control, I think, is a very good thing in, in terms of writing as well. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we have uh, Dr. Christina now. Good afternoon, ma'am. Good afternoon. Um, in folded, uh, we see that patriarchal ideology that constricts nature as a commodity wrestles with material reality of humans. Where exactly where exactly can we strike or achieve a balance? Or like Divan Sahib in the novel, should we believe that love for nature must be tested by adversity? You know, when I wrote The Folded Earth, I was living here in Rani Khet, surrounded by uh, 
people who had grown old here, many of them have died now, who were intensely knowledgeable about the, uh, the landscape and the wilderness around, and they were not romantics, but you could understand that you need to understand that human beings are not the priority and the only thing in the world. Uh, and by not realizing that each thing such as a tree or an animal has its own place and is important to us. Now we can see what the climate crisis is doing to our world because we have always put human needs over every other. And uh, I think striking a balance really now, the balance has to be on the other side. We have to prioritize uh, which we won't, of course, because we will destroy ourselves and the natural world, and uh, that's the end of it. But these people who lived in Raniket, on who, an amalgam of whom Divan Sahab was, brought in the best of sort of uh, practicality and unromantic notion of the uh, world of nature being essential to the world of man and of the need to know it and to preserve it, being essential to preserving ourselves. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, we have Reema Neela Megam. Ms. Reema ne Neela Megam? Yes, yes yeah. sir. Yes. Go ahead. And, uh, good evening, uh, Professor. Good evening, uh, evening ma'am. Thank you, Silit, for leaving us, ma'am, so close to us. I'm so happy with that. and love to hear from you, ma'am. And ma'am, how do you find the presence of the narrative that would basically give profound meaning to history that you were recurrently speaking in all your novels? The stories are basically historical, sometimes political, uh, demony in the environment or a place for humans to live. Like uh, the struggles you that both the son and the mother encounter in the shackled world in all the lives we will live, mm -hmm. uh, we never lived is profound. And how do you seek the aid of uh, memories and narrative to well suit the novel? It's very hard to tell. Uh, it's it's quite difficult to explain how the novel gets written uh, in in these. Um, ways that divide and analyze it. Because when I think about, when I see the novel right at the end, I know that at the beginning there may have been just an image or a sense of a character who, which has I've been carrying for quite a few years. And then the whole business of developing this image happens through fits and starts of a lot of thinking, structuring, cancelling, deleting, daydreaming. It's very hard to tell how exactly it happens and how much role memory plays in it. But I know that the novels discuss or, or the novels are involved quite a lot in analyzing how, how we as humans structure narratives through unreliable memory. So Mishkin's memories in all the lives, he continuously questions them. And he wonders if in the act of trying to remember, he is going to the edge of insanity because things start to assume so many different forms. And thank you, ma'am. Thank you for your wonderful presentation of the present, I mean, the modern political scenario in your novel. I love this novel a lot when compared to all the three of the novels. And thank you so much, ma'am. Thank, thank you for your question. Thank you, thank you ma'am. Thank you. Uh, Ma'am, I have a question. Can I ask you? Yes, of course. Uh, you are a media critic with strong views on attempt to polarize different communities in India. Mm -hmm. You have condemned the selective tax rates and arbitrary arrests. Does your response to contemporary events influence your novel writing? I, I would, uh, that, uh... That last bit, the thing, I haven't written anything like that. It must be something you have. Uh, it's, just, it's just a question. Does, no, no. Okay. Do your political views influence your fiction? I'm sure they do, because we write from any, any fiction we write ultimately ends up conveying a, 
a political uh, stand through the things it says and through the worldview it espouses. So definitely they do. Yes. Uh, thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, we have Sharon Christie. Uh, hello, thank you so much for allowing me to um, ask a question. Ma'am. Firstly, thank you so much for being here with us today and for sharing your thoughts and uh, your ideas with us. It's been amazing. And uh, I just have uh, a couple of questions for you. The first is, do you have any kind of a writing ritual as such where, you know, like you exile yourself or you just go to a particular place and you have this particular nook or something where you have to sit and write because I was just looking at the way uh, your, you know, your, your place was when you were creating that amazing bits of pottery and it was so amazing. There was so much calm. It was so serene and peaceful. Do you think all of that is needed to be conducive to a writer or, or do you think writing is possible anywhere? That's the first question. And the second is, um, do you have any uh, like ritual as such, not a ritual uh, in, the, in the sense of an actual ritual, but do you have any process as such before you write something where you do a little bit of research work or uh, an idea comes to you and you keep, uh, let it simmer for some time and then you begin to write only after ascertaining if it will be good, if it will be okay to start working on it. Just some tips for an aspiring writer, ma'am. The first question you asked about uh, a calm space, I think you do need a, I think you need quite a lot of routine. I'm, uh, but it doesn't have to uh, have to be some kind of, ex I can't write when things are disruptive, when there's too much going on. I definitely need a sense of a day being predictable in order to be able to write. I need to start writing in the morning etc. But uh, when I wrote the first book, I didn't live here in Raniket. It was begun in Delhi and I didn't have that kind of space that you saw at all in the studio. The studio is very peaceful and calm and I, I'm extremely lucky to be working where I am now. But I think I could, and I have worked in plenty of other spaces as well. I've written things in airports and hotels and, uh, you know, other houses or and so on. So I think you you make a space if you need to write something. And the second uh, question is, I I what I tend to do is if I have an idea, if if a, at a certain point there is something that has been a certain image has been haunting me for several years, or I feel I need to find out what it is, the need to find out what is behind an image or what is at the end of an or the other side of the image is really what drives me to write it out and to write it out is a way of finding out for me what the idea plaguing me is all about and I would write a first draft very quickly without any research or too much thinking at all just while the charge of that idea is alive and very vibrant inside me and then when I realize, okay, I'm making something of this first draft, I would then step back and figure out what research I need to do and how I need to go about it. Thank you so much. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, there is one Mr. Abhilash who says mm -hmm. he cannot operate his mic. So shall I read his question? Yes, of course. He writes like this. Thank you, Skelet and Anuradha, ma'am, for uh, being with us. The question is, are you writing for yourself or for the readers? What is your advice for a person who wants to start practicing his skills as a writer? I, I think I do write for myself. I write, if I feel interested in finding out, as I said, what this image might develop into, that's the only motivation to write it. If I feel bored uh, and think that I have to write it for somebody else, I, I would never get things written. So I think you need to write for yourself. Although at the time that you're shaping the whole narrative to especially towards the later drafts, then you're aware, of course, that there is a reader and you need to be able to communicate what you've written to that reader. So it's at that stage that you become aware of the reader. And I think if you 
write only in order to get published, then I'm, I'm not sure that anything very good will start off. To start off with, at least you ought to be writing for yourself and not thinking of whether you, you should be writing it even if you don't get published, is what I mean. Thank you, ma'am. I uh, hope Abhilash, you got your answer. We have Prince Albert with another question. Yes, Albert, go ahead. Uh, yeah, uh, I had another question. In all the lives we never lived, each chapter you start off with some uh, word on top. And yeah. whenever Miskin writes, there's this one word. But when Gayatri, when we read Gayatri's letter, there's some other word. And you what mean does the that writing mean? in a different script? Yeah, but you no, know, it, it's. I think it's Arabic or Urdu. I don't know what it is. The uh, parts where Miskin is writing uh, is yeah. Urdu. And okay. it's just the name of the place, Muntazir. That's what is written uh, there. And, and read, where read, Gayatri writes, she the, the word is written in Balinese. And it's also the name of the place, which is Ubud. Uh, okay, so it's the place. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Thank you, Prince. And thank you, ma'am. We have one more question from uh, Ms. Janani. Can you tell us something about your experience when you visited Bali in the places where water spice had been in? Can Hello. you hear me now? Yeah, I can hear you. You want it's to know about Bali? Yes, ma'am, about your experience yeah. and how yeah. Yeah. Well, um, Walter Spies lived in two places in Bali. And uh, I had gone there for a literary festival. And after uh, seeing his paintings, I uh, wanted to see his house. And there is one house that is now a hotel, which is in this main town where the festival took place, called Ubud. And, um, but other than that, he had left that and gone off to a quite remote little mountain village called Isse. And that's where he had built his house and painted some of his really uh, masterpieces. This place proved to be very difficult to find because whenever uh, Rukun and I had both gone, this was, I think, the second or third time we were in Bali. And by some miracle, after trying to find out about this place, Ise, for many days, and nobody was willing to take us because it was remote, we were standing on the main street and a taxi came up and the driver immediately recognized the place and said he was from a village right next to it. So he drove us up to that place and at that time the house was locked. It was in private hands and it was locked. But the next time we went, we found that they had opened up the house. This was after the book came out. So the owners got in touch when they knew about the book and they were the original family who had allowed Walter Spies to build uh, a little hut. He had just built a small cottage for himself. That's now quite a beautiful boutique hotel where you are in the rooms with the furniture that Walter Spies would have used and also other artists. And it's a very calm, tranquil place that overlooks the volcano Mount Agu uh, which which had eruptions very recently in fact it's surrounded by paddy fields and you got a real sense of why Walter Spies lived there because of the whole business of being in this incredible you know hilltop with a volcano in front thank you uh, we have Mr. John Stewart with a question Hello, ma'am. Am I audible? Yeah. Ma'am, how do you arrive at the titles of your novels, ma'am? Do they descend on you during the creative process, maybe beginning or after writing the novel? Or do you struggle with the choice and decision for long? That's a very good question because it's uh, something that's extremely difficult. You know, unlike the novel itself, where uh, 
it's entirely my business what i write in the novel other people can offer editorial suggestions but i really don't have to take them but the moment it comes to the title then um, the publishers are can be very insistent on particular titles or on not having particular titles because they have to sell the book and as a publisher myself i understand how important it is to have a good title that uh conveys something about the book which which sort of grabs the whole book in a few words and uh triggers the imagination of the reader as well so the title has to do a lot of work and with the folded earth the title came as you said it just arrived uh, all made and was never rethought but with the other three books i had to do a lot of thinking and i came up with whole lists of titles and ultimately we all agreed on one of them each time thank you ma'am uh, there is another question i will read that question which of your four novels satisfies you the most as an author none of them really because the moment they are finished and published i start thinking of uh bits that i should have done differently bits that i would now cut out i think maybe when i'm 80 years old i'll start rewriting them all one by one thank you ma'am and uh there is one more question in an interview you have said working in the world of books is the best kind of work you contribute in different ways in book production did you have prior knowledge in this field or was it a leap of faith what were what are what are the advantages of living with books what are the disadvantages of living with books uh well i trained as a student with a publishing company run by a cousin of mine so i was introduced to it quite early in life and then you publishing is something you learn on the job almost always you slowly you start as a junior in whatever it is editorial production marketing and you slowly learn the ropes and uh the reason i said it's the best kind of work is that you do get to uh, read quite a lot that is good you get to shape books that you feel involved in and on the whole you deal with authors who are uh people you feel interested in their uh, thoughts and ideas interest you so and you make uh, often great friends with those authors which are lifelong friendships as well as enmities sometimes but on the whole it's a very good thing to be working on books there is another question in the chat room miss annapurna mahanta could you unmute and ask the question Uh, madam uh, what is your impression about the indian young writers would you like to suggest more i i uh, i haven't read to uh, by young writers do you mean really children or some ad, or just young writers? young writers young yeah. writers about about uh, any type of social controversial topics like that no many people are writing really interesting and exciting new things i haven't read a huge amount but i i whatever i read uh in in the media as well as in books like with tishani doshi is young compared to me but she is not a uh, she is in her 40s i suppose she is a very exciting poet and a wonderful writer i i feel interested in writers who are interested in language and that's why there are not a huge number that i follow but there are plenty of exciting and interesting voices i think okay thank you An another question ma'am can you tell us when you tell us how your father in law built a community of readers he had a bookshop in lucknow which he had begun in 1948 and the bookshop was a small one and a specialized one he used to stock mainly scholarly books related to south east south asia but he also had books of general interest as well as art books and the bookshop 
when you entered it had beautiful uh, wooden shelves with glass panes the books were behind these glass panes so you had the impression somehow of being let into someone's house which had books only you could buy those books and the person who was in the house would be able to tell you all about all the books on the shelves so it had a very unique atmosphere which was personal and accessible and uh, it, as if each of the books was hand picked so that's how he built up that shop into what it became it was a kind of oasis for people in lucknow who could consult him on all kinds of things thank you i think we have uh, time for one last question and that will be from ms abinaya ms abinaya ma'am good afternoon ma'am good afternoon ma'am you love nature and animals and i have also found a certain eco critical perspective in your novels ma'am mm -hmm. are you interested in uh, being a uh, environment i mean like uh, are you interested in environmental activism in particular or being a writer activist in your future works i don't think i'm an activist in the sense of someone who i'm i'm not someone who enjoys joining up you know joining groups joining crowds i i don't think of myself literally as an activist in that sense but if activism means that through your writing you are uh, sort of espousing a different kind of world view to the one that find dominant around yourself in that sense i would say i'm an activist but not in the literal sense yes ma'am are you interested in writing any future books regarding environmentalism or uh, any work that um, encourages environmentalism ma'am i've been thinking for a while about writing um, about the wild plants around me but i haven't thought of environmentalism as such no uh, yes ma'am thank you ma'am ma'am uh, we have another abhinaya who is trying to ask you a question so this would be the last question i assure you okay yeah yeah That's good afternoon ma'am i think i'm audible yes uh, it's a pleasure talking to you ma'am i have one question pertaining to the novel uh, all the lives we never lived and when i read the novel i could see layers of uh, power structure in it in the family in the child's world and and the most dominant of them is the power exercised by mishkin's father the one who became like a, a tyrant what do you have to tell to women like gayatri who face unending struggle to manage between their desires and the expectations that the society keeps in front of them and there are women who bury their desires and accept oppression as normalcy so what's your opinion on it ma'am i i think you know in in the time when gayatri was uh, fighting her battles one of the main problems really was the lack of economic independence because there were not that many avenues by which women could earn a living and all of this patriarchy is very highly rooted in economic independence i think and the moment women feel economically independent the equation can change if or at least they have the ability to change it so things today for at least some women must be quite a bit different from they were for her although for many women it's much the same and power is exercised in many subtle ways in households which i mean that's not going to go away anytime soon i can't hear you anymore and you okay. abhi abhinaya uh thank you ma'am it was a pleasure talking to you i should yes, answer I... your question i'm not yes sure yes I... yes i had i guessed it and uh, yeah. you said it right thank you thank you so much for uh, taking time to talk to thank us you. i love the atmosphere where you are seated and oh. i could see one or two comments in the chat box people yeah. uh, keep telling that the uh, place that you are seated is very lovely yeah, and I'm uh very lucky. i i felt like talking to a friend so mm -hmm. i was listening to all the questions and your answer it was like more uh, it was really nice talking to you ma'am and i Thank also you. 
Thanks, Kilit, for making this possible, for making us uh, talk to a wonderful person like Anuradha Roy. Thank, thank you, ma'am. Thank, thank you. Thank you so much. Now, uh, we, are, we are immensely grateful to you, Anuradha, for this wonderful session. <laughs> and thank you so much for sharing your journey of creative zeal yeah. and uh, for giving us a space to interact with you and to gain inspiration from you. Thank, Thank you, you so for much. inviting me and for setting it's all, all this up. It's I'm all absolutely, pleasure. It was wonderful to be with all of you. Thank really. you. Thank you. Bye bye. Oh, uh, one yeah. second. Yes. Oh, there you are. I thought you had uh, left the meeting. <laughs> no way. <laughs> no way. They just didn't want uh, you to see me anymore. That's all. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Thank you very much, Anuradha, for all your time and patience. And more I think important, you are the person who has been the most patient of all, because oh. you began this whole process about two years ago of <laughs> setting up something yeah. at Skillet. And I wanted to come and it just never happened. And now it's happened in this way. But thank you for your patience. Oh, and thank <laughs> you more importantly for your amazing novels. Actually, your novels have uh, brought us all closer together. You know, we will uh, let you go now to your two beloved tyrants <laughs> with the assurance that you will come back to us in person when traveling becomes a possibility. Okay. And I also want to thank each one of the participants for yes. your enthusiastic support. And they had such lovely questions, really, some of them quite difficult to answer. But mm -hmm. I'll be thinking of the questions later and wondering if I managed to answer. Oh, them. You, you did. It's not just the background that is lovely. You are a <laughs> lovely person yourself. Thank you. <laughs> and all of you, we will meet again soon. Uh, yeah. Till then, thank you very much. And bye from all the members of the Skillet team. Thank you, Thank especially you. Anuradha. Thank Please you. Stay in touch. Yes. Bye bye. Thank bye you bye. so much for having me. Bye. Bye. Mm -hmm.